Welcome to the premiere of Litchfield Jazz Presents, a virtually yours concert series, streamed live from Telefunken Soundstage. The first concert celebrates the 80th birthday of a giant of avant-garde jazz, a Connecticut native with an international reputation, bassist Mario Pavone. Over a career that spans 60 years, Mario has collaborated with legendary innovators and today's most talented young musicians to define the cutting edge of jazz. And unlike most artists with longevity, some of his most recent recordings are his most widely acclaimed, appearing on best of lists almost every year. Mario Pavone is a respected composer, performer, and educator, who's also a Renaissance man. He's a gardener, a cook, and this will come as a surprise to even those who know his music well. He's also an accomplished visual artist whose work has graced many an album cover. Tonight, we're pleased to have you join us to enjoy his music and to honor Mario Pavone, appearing with his dialect trio, Matt Mitchell on piano and Tyshawn Sori on drums. I'm John Dankosky, and I have the great pleasure of presenting one of my favorite people in music, one of my favorite people anywhere. Mario Pavone has been not just a legend in jazz, but he's been a teacher, he's been an inspiration, and he's played with some of the most amazing creative musicians in the world. Tonight, from the Telefunken Soundstage, we are going to present some music presented by the Litchfield Jazz Festival. In just a little bit, we'll get a chance to talk with Mario on this very important night. But first, let me introduce Matt Mitchell, Tyshawn Sori, and Mario Pavone. Thank you, John.
Yeah, thank you all for joining us here at the Telefunken Soundstage. Um, I'm so happy to have these two remarkable musicians here. Uh, their achievements already that they both have under their accomplishments is remarkable. Taishan Sori is a 2017 MacArthur Grant recipient um, and is an incredible composer across the genres, opera, classical chamber music, improvised music, and jazz, and uh, has collaborated with V.J. Iyer, Jason Moran, Steve Lehman. Um, equally amazing pianist, Matt Mitchell is a, a Pew Fellow and a uh, Doris Duke Impact Award uh, recipient. Um, he's also a brilliant composer. A lot of his work is on Pi recordings, and he's uh, filled the incredible chairs and collaborated with Dave Douglas, Donnie McCaslin, Rudresh Mahantapa, and Lee Kolitz. Uh, we opened up with a piece called Cobalt, which we've recorded together, and uh, we follow that with bass chords. Uh, we're gonna continue along with a new piece uh, as yet unrecorded, uh, and we hope to do that this late fall, conditions allowing. Uh, it's dedicated to the late, great civil rights icon, John Lewis, and it's called Good Treble. Thank you. 
thank you, studio <laughs> friends here. We have about a dozen beautiful friends and uh, a whole host of wonderfully gifted technicians here at Telefunken. Uh, a couple of years ago, I took some deep dive into some of the great Thelonious Sphere monks' music. And uh, I've written a couple pieces uh, that were inspired, let's say, by him. Uh, this one was inspired by uh, the piece Reflections, and this one's called Refraction.
out to it. But like we used to do. Yeah, yeah. Okay. We're going to finish this first set uh, of a piece called Chrome. The mission of literary performing arts is to help largely young people find their best selves, give them all the tools they need to do that. And mostly through the vehicle of jazz, but other ways too. Yeah. I think what drew me to jazz was the fact that you could improvise over chord changes, that it wasn't just classical where there's like a written melody that you have to play certain notes. Litchfield is special because of the family environment. The way it's run is smooth from start to finish. The fact that you don't have to send in an audition tape to come here really sends the message that anyone is welcome. There's something vital about youth and about what they're experiencing right now. The jazz camp started in 1997. We run a program that runs for four weeks. It's a boarding and day program with in excess of 300 people attending. Our youngest student ever was nine and our oldest student was an 80-year-old piano player. 
there. We originally decided to come to Litchfield Jazz Camp because we were doing a search on camps that involved music, and this one was so highly rated. I decided to go to Litchfield Jazz Camp because I saw a lot of great faculty members. It's been a joy, very heart filling. I've made friends from like all over the world, and I think that sense of community is just really special and it brings people together. My daughter is a bassist, her name is Mile. From the moment she got here, she said, Mom, this is my second home. Most of Jazz's formative years was the apprenticeship system. The older ones and more experienced ones share with the younger ones and less experienced. So we formed the classes around this model. I know where they're at, the way it feels to be surrounded by all these kids that can play music. I could give them the opportunity to express themselves the way they want to. This has been one of the most consistent things in my life for you know the past five years. It really does feel like a Litchfield jazz camp family here. It's more than just like a teacher-student relationship. They give you their information and everything, and it just feels like working together and having that type of relationship. The reason I teach jazz music in general is to help 300 people become better versions of themselves. Luke said it was his favorite camp. He came here all three times not knowing anyone. He really enjoyed and he felt that this is just a community he wanted to continue to be part of. It's amazing to see what they know at such a young age. We learn from the students too, yeah. just as much. Outside of the classroom, the faculty have been so incredibly welcoming. For all of the students, we all feel really close with them. They're all just such amazing people. It's important to have the kids know that even though they're starting up, you can have a career in music. In other schools, they may just say, oh, it's just a little fun thing to do, it's a hobby. But we give that opportunity of real world experience that you can do it. It's not just about music, it's about life. It's about living a good and full and happy life. So when our kids get out into the world, they're ready on so many levels. It's a fulfilling experience in all areas, between the friendships you make, the music you make. Mila has found her people at Litchfield. I'm just happy for her. I'm happy she's found her place. I would definitely suggest the camp to other families. Folks come hang out with us and leave better, faster, stronger, like the $6 million jazz musician. It's nice. <laughs> it's nice when it's nice. It's great fun. Yeah, and we have a great time doing it. The whole, the whole journey is fun. And welcome back to Telefunk and Soundstage. I'm John Dankosky. I'm here with Mario Pavone. Mario, it's so good to see you. Great and, to see you. And congratulations yeah. on this great night. Great. Wonderful celebration. Yeah, yeah. you know, and, and I've got some things to give you in just a second. Before I do that, before we talk for a minute, I want to thank Telefunk. It's an amazing facility, and we've been taken so well care of uh, here today and for all of these Litchfield Jazz Festival events. Also, thanks to Downbeat Magazine, Real Artways, Firehouse 12, Hartford Jazz Society for helping to spread the word about this really important event. And you also see on your screen that there's ways that you can donate to the Litchfield Jazz Festival. If you make a donation of $150 or more, I feel like I'm in a public radio <laughs> fundraiser here, um, you can get a CD, Mario Pavone and his dialect trio. That's what we're hearing tonight uh, with Matt Mitchell and Tyshawn Sori. So that's just one of the ways that you can make a donation. Maybe we can start with the Litchfield Jazz Festival. Of all the things we're celebrating, yeah. 25 years being part of the Jazz Festival family. Festival and, well, the and the camp. And the camp. Yeah. Well, tell us about the camp. Tell us about what that relationship means to you. Uh, the camp, well, it's at the heart of everything, I think, that, that we do at the Litchfield Jazz Festival under the helm of Vita Muir. And uh, the, the, the camp is, is, is a great experience for the kids. 25 years watching the kids uh, feel this em this empowerment uh, in music and as as people as young people uh, and I come away every year this as first year I didn't uh, teach any classes it was this year but uh, the virtual thing but I come away every year feeling wow I've learned a whole pile and it's <laughs> it's really gratifying it's, it's it's nothing nothing like else what I do yeah, yeah and, and it's it's teaching very young people, younger, frankly, than you were when you started in music, right? Yeah, yeah, they're about well, 13 to, to 17 is, I would say, the majority of our student body, yeah. How important do you think jazz education is right now? Oh, I think it's important, very important. I mean, I think we're seeing the results of it. Uh, the, the young players that are coming out now are, really have a great, great wealth of, of, of stuff at their fingertips. Uh, uh, I also think, uh, I hope we will get out of this situation we are in in the world uh, soon because it's, uh, 
all of this it needs to be always enhanced by experience on the, on the ground on the job with you know they get mentored at mm -hmm. the camp but mentoring you know and the actual bandstand and the fellowship that goes down on the bandstand. Yeah, he yeah. hearing real live people give you feedback about what yeah. you're doing. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Th that's incredibly important. Yeah. 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 And obviously, so you've been very involved with, with Litchfield Jazz for such a long time and teaching, but as I said before, you started your career a little later than some of these kids. Yeah. When did you get started playing music for uh, real? 20, I was 24, and uh, I went out to Chicago and saw this great the guitar player Joe DiOrio, and he was encouraging. I was a jazz lover. I became a jazz lover in late high school and, and early college. And uh, I went out. He encouraged me. I came back. I rented a bass, and I had uh, several lessons studying with uh, the great chamber player Bertram Turetsky. And I was on my way. I was in New York uh, within months, and was fortunate. Paul Blay took me to Europe. I hardly, <laughs> hardly knew the bass really. How long were you playing before Paul Blay took you to Europe? Uh, I'd say about a year and a half. How yeah. the hell did you do that? I don't know. I don't know. Let's start again. <laughs> <laughs> I want to start again so I can maybe, you know, do a do-over. But uh, no, it, it's worked. It's worked yeah. for me. Uh, uh, loving the music is, of course, the big, the big ingredient for everybody, really. You have to really love this music. And uh, uh, I never thought of, of the obstacles. Certainly, as the years went by, I always was starting to think, well, I need to learn more. The more you know, the more mm -hmm. you want to know, uh, the more you need to know. But uh, it's worked. I've had a great life in music, 50-something uh, years, and uh, uh, I'm, I feel fulfilled. I'm, I'm very, very humbled by, by the fact that I've had a life in, around the world in music, yeah. What, yeah. could be, what could be better doing what you... I was an engineer uh, yeah. up until that time and quit my job and went to John Coltrane's funeral. That yeah. was really it after that. You it, know? You, it, and that's really the inspiration for you. Yeah. yeah. Coltrane was a big inspiration. Uh, to me, He, besides his great prowess and spirituality and that he had, he, he, he had this almost... He said to me, Mary and I were on our honeymoon that day, six, 59, well, next week's our 59th anniversary. Congratulations. At, when they were, thank you. <laughs> when they were recording the Live at the Vanguard, a yeah. seminal record. And uh, he, one of the things he was saying to me was, you too can do this, to all of us. You mm -hmm. can do this. You can do what I do. And it was, it was amazing that, that that was part of his message. What's so interesting about that <laughs> is that so many people would, would see Coltrane, they'd hear Coltrane and, and think, I couldn't possibly do that. Yeah. How, how could he say, I could do what yeah. he's doing right yeah. now? But he spoke to you, and you actually heard it and said, yeah, I'm going to do that. Yeah, yeah, exactly. That's I went amazing. out and rented, you know, and, and that was it. And it was in New York. And, yeah, he did. He, he said, I know, how does that work? I guess some kind of... Well, you know, the, 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 the prowess contains, should contain, the great spirituality of things should contain both elements, the humbleness, and he certainly was, and a giant and humble at the same time. It's, I still get moved when I, when I think about him, even much less hear the old records and stuff, yeah. yeah. As your career in music progressed, how did the way that you hear music change? I mean, because you started, you just dove right in, yeah. and you were learning as you went, but you were learning with some of the great jazz players and, and yeah. improvisational players in the world. I mean, how did, how did it start to change for you over time? Well, the, the, my early mentors like Blay and Bill Dixon and uh, uh, really, really uh, said a lot. They were doing it. They had much more elevated knowledge and stuff, but they, they, they had an openness to it that, that, that you know, let me in, I would say. And then really what happened that was, I think, a, a really big change was uh, meeting some of the great Chicago players that moved east, so like Wadada, Leo Smith, and Anthony Braxton. And uh, that really, these guys were also into composition and a whole new realm of composition. It was like, turn the East Coast from black and white. We were all down there playing free music. And it turned the, the black and white scene of New York into Technicolor is mm. what happened. They came in with this a lot of extra, extra instruments and, and a lot of color and, and great emphasis on composition. Yeah. But Moo Hall, of course, also. Yeah. But 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 learning how to compose, this is an entirely different different skill set, right? It's yeah. it's part of the music, 
but the level at which you, you learned to compose from these folks, it, it does take it to a, another level. How did you start to hear as a composer I then? think I, the bass was a, a, a kind of a way in for me. I wrote only from the bass, didn't go to the piano for a long time, each piece. So I wrote from the bass, so the, I started picturing the bass graphically. Mm. Mingus talked about getting outside the bass and looking at the, 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 the fingerboard as a piano and fifths and fourths and then tritones and stuff. And I started to visualize it literally graphically, mm. like a painter would or a graphic artist. And uh, that's the math, math, mathematical aspect. I, I thought it, it gave me a way in. I was coming up with these things and trying them and trying them, and uh, they sounded terrible. <laughs> I, and then they started sounding better. Yeah. <laughs> Yay. So. <laughs> but, but so as you're learning how to do that, I mean, traditionally, if you were going to school to learn how to be a composer, yeah. they wouldn't teach you to compose from the bass. And so you were no. probably hearing the music entirely differently because yes. you were mapping it out like yes, that. Uh, yes, I, I, I was. I think it gave me a, a unique view coming just solely from the bass. And, uh, and you know, you, two note things were about the most you could do with double stops and stuff. But uh, yeah, and then, then I had great people collaborating with me. Uh, uh, voicing and arranging some of the music, and it was great working together, and it just just kept booming. Yeah. So as your as your career progressed, you've played in all sorts of different um, styles, and you've played with so many different musicians in different configurations. Tell me about playing trio music. What's special about that for yeah, you? Yeah, for the last ten years, especially, I've really been uh, into it, and lucky to have to play with a lot of great piano player and drummers. The, the piano trio in jazz is, uh, is such a, a wide open thing. I mean, you can think of the normal quintet, p tenor sax and trumpet, but the piano trio is the whole orchestra. And there's a tradition there from Stride to Bill Evans to Bud Powell to Witten to, and all the, to Cecil and all the way up. And it just seemed, for what I was trying to do, which is uh, have an openness, and I still am far from effectively mastering this at all, but an openness with uh, forward motion and pulsation is still very important to me, and uh, somehow the two is what I'm trying to do, I guess, yeah. So so then this trio, you've been playing together for about six, six seven years? Yep, yep. A and tell me about playing with this particular group of, of musicians. Well, uh, <laughs> basically, I give them a sheet of music, but they hardly need five <laughs> notes, really. Just give these guys five notes, and they will create beautiful music with it. Is how I feel about it. I mean, so, and uh, and they're both they're both just so generous of spirit and generous uh, to my music and to me. And, uh, and so it's it's so easy playing with them. It really is is remarkable because uh, the page is not the central thing. Mm. Yeah. T tell me more about that. Well. As I said, I give them a few notes, so we're, we're listening, we're working off each other, and uh, uh, you know, I don't know. It's just, it's just this, this thing happens. That's all. This thing happens, and uh, Taishan is is a flow, and the Taishan, Taishan's breath in music, the the wideness and broadness of his music is remarkable, uh, and and uh, he kind of. A, absorbs the music first time through. He looks at it, he's got it. Put the 10 sheets down, he's got it. And Matt's pretty much the same way. And uh, uh, Matt's an amazing pianist to me. He captures both of those parts, yeah. Um, I don't know, it's, a, it's a, not an easy thing to talk about uh, uh, when, when it happens, yeah. Yeah, and, and this, this idea of having both openness, but then there's a lot, in all of your music, there's these very, very dense pa passages yeah. that, that feel as though a bunch of things are colliding at once and then they open back up again. Yeah. I mean, are you thinking, you were talking about learning the bass visually almost, are you thinking in terms of openness, things closing up, visual Absolutely. patterns? Absolutely, I am, I am. And I, I want to still have work to do on that to, to really get it even more, uh, uh, dimensional that way and, and trans transitional that way. Uh, I am thinking that and uh, I like uh, the contrast between the denseness and then the air mm -hmm. and the denseness with uh, 
the openness of rhythm or maybe the absence of rhythm and then into rhythm, yeah, yeah. yeah. Do you ever, I, I, a couple of years ago, I, I remember hearing your, your band playing street songs that was oh, a, yeah. an accordion based ensemble. And a lot of that music harkened back to the, the music that you heard in, in Waterbury as a kid. Yeah. How much of the music that you grew up with do you put back into the music that you play today? Oh, I think it's all there. Uh, starting at my, during the war, Second World War, my mom took me to the movies, so is it David Raskin, I mean, all these great movie scores, and movie music, and she loved all the, the film noir and the Joan Crawfords and Barbara Stanwyck's, and it was, it, it, wow, the, mu the music was the thing for me right then and there, but I didn't, I kind of didn't quite get that that's what I was doing. And then I went to a high school in Waterbury, that was majority black high school, and there's where I really learned the contrast between you know, rhythm and blues was there before rock and roll, and I've got to really an insight from these players of, of, of black music uh, in that field, in, in rhythm and blues. And uh, I started realizing these guys sang when they'd walk down the, the hallways and stuff, and I love that music. But I didn't hear jazz. I remember hearing Charlie Parker with strings when maybe I was 13. Mm. I said, wow, that embraceable you, that's amazing. Melody and then... He's doing these things in between, it, you know, <laughs> filigrees. Well, yeah, not really, but so. Uh, but then, I there was this guy in the fraternity that I was in in 1958 that had this amazing, some main amazing record collection, and I can remember those first records, uh, Brubeck and Ahmad Jamal, then further, and, and just like. Really, it just, uh, I, I didn't get through that semester. Went back, did graduate with a 3.0, <laughs> but that, that first semester was a mess because uh, I got drawn into the music and, and it was just, the, the, the love was setting in. So I got out, went in the, in the National Guard and then came back at it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I know we're going to get back and, and start to play some music in, in just a couple yeah. minutes, but um, what, what, more do you want to, to accomplish? I mean, you're talking about putting out another record, yeah. maybe sometime soon. You're still talking, Mario, like you've got so much to learn on the instrument, which of yeah. course, for people who are watching, say, how can you have anything else well, to learn? I mean, what do, what do you still want to do here? I just want to keep going. Uh, the music, the music is keeping me going right now. We have some, you know, 80, I have some health issues, but the music keeps me going. And, uh, to the extent that I have the energy, uh, you know, you just, family and music at this point for me yeah hmm. yeah I, I actually want to give you a couple things here there, there are a few special things I want to give you so first of all this is the this is a, a signed letter from the Connecticut Community Foundation it used to be the Waterbury Foundation right. and it's a very nice framed oh, framed you. letter sort of as a as a commemoration of your 60 years of music your 80 years on this planet yeah. and then I got I got one more here for you oh getting the plaques they're getting the plaques this is this is always a nice thing it's uh, from the Hartford Jazz Society. Oh, Happy hopefully. 80th birthday, yeah. Mario Pavone. Oh, beautiful. Yeah. And, you, and you've got Great a lot of people you know, play music in New York for such a long time, play music all over the world, but there's still this vibrant jazz scene here in Connecticut. So many people who are part of Connecticut jazz that, yeah. that you know so well and you've played with for so many years. Yeah, oh, it's great players in the state, and uh, from the state and out, out in the world, and many of them came through the Litchfield Jazz Camp. I mean, that's one of the things about 25 years now, you p kids coming in at 14 and going out at 18 and coming back to teach and contribute back to the to the camp. That's really incredible. And just uh, the credentials of the players that have <laughs> left there. Connecticut's great. It's great for bass players, especially. Yeah. <laughs> A lot of great bass players here. <laughs> well, I, I want to thank you so much for speaking with me for just a little bit and for this amazing concert and just for all the music. I've been listening Thank to music so much, for John. a very long time. I was telling you before, I sought you out when I first came to Connecticut because I was yeah. listening to your records back in Pittsburgh where I grew up and I thought to myself, God, this guy lives in Connecticut. I could just call him up. Yeah. And so we've known each other for a little, oh, little while yeah, and it's, it's really good to see you doing so you well. You too, thanks so much. John. Yeah, it's a pleasure. Well, you know, I'm gonna turn things over to Vita Muir. We were talking about the Litchfield Jazz Festival and well, the Litchfield Jazz Festival is basically Vita Muir. You know, you've got on the bottom of your screen there ways that you can contribute. As I was saying, we've got CDs available for donations of $150 or more. And well, let me turn things over to Vita before we start, start the, the, the second set. Vita? 
and have it. All right. Scott. I wanted to wish uh, an extraordinarily happy birthday to my dear, dear friend, Mario Pavone. Thank you, Vita. You're welcome, my love. I have known Mario for um, the 25 years of the life of the Litchfield Jazz Festival. When we started um, Everything's a Research Project, and so I asked an editor of a magazine, well, how do I scope out who I should have? And he said, well, besides all these famous people, you've got to have somebody local. So, okay, who's local? Mario was already very well known in Europe, but I figured I could call him local because he lived in Prospect. And so he joined us. He played on that first festival. He played on the second festival. And he's been engaged in the life of Litchfield Jazz ever since. He's the vice president of our board. Uh, he's my mentor in music. He taught me how to develop a lineup. We learned it by sitting on the floor in my office and putting sheets of paper around and moving them. It worked like a charm. He basically taught me everything I know, and uh, I have a lot more to learn. So. Um, thank you. I want to say thank you, thank you to everybody who tuned in tonight and to all the very generous people who uh, donated money to make this series that we're running virtually um, a, a reality and make it so that we could offer it to the public for free. Donations are, of course, always welcome because everything costs more than you think it does. Uh, but we're very, very happy to be able to do this and very happy to have you here with us. Thank you so much, and thank you, John. The mission of Literary Performing Arts is to help largely young people find their best selves, give them all the tools they need to do that. And mostly through the vehicle of jazz, but other ways too. Yeah. I think what drew me to jazz was the fact that you could improvise over chord changes, that it wasn't just classical where there's like a written melody that you have to play certain notes. Litchfield is special because of the family environment. The way it's run is smooth from start to finish. The fact that you don't have to send in an audition tape to come here really sends the message that anyone is welcome. There's something vital about youth and about what they're experiencing right now. The jazz camp started in 1997. We run a program that runs for four weeks. It's a boarding and day program with in excess of 300 people attending. Our youngest student ever was nine and our oldest student was a 80 year old piano player. We originally decided to come to Litchfield Jazz Camp because we were doing a search on camps that involved music, and this one was so highly rated. I decided to go to Litchfield Jazz Camp because I saw a lot of great faculty members. It's been a joy, very heart filling. I've made friends from like all over the world, and I think that sense of community is just really special and it brings people together. My daughter is a bassist. Her name is Mile. From the moment she got here, she said, Mom, this is my second home. Most of Jazz's formative years was the apprenticeship system. The older ones and more experienced ones share with the younger ones and less experienced. So we formed the classes around this model. I know where they're at, the way it feels to be surrounded by all these kids that can play music. I could give them the opportunity to express themselves the way they want to. This has been one of the most consistent things in my life for, you know, the past five years. It really does feel like a Litchfield jazz camp family here. It's more than just like a teacher student relationship. They give you their information and everything and it just feels like working together and having that type of relationship. The reason I teach jazz music in general is to help 300 people become better versions of themselves. Luke said it was his favorite camp. He came here all three times not knowing anyone. He really enjoyed and he felt that this is just a community he wanted to continue to be part of. It's amazing to see what they know at such a young age. We learn from the students too, yeah. just as much. Outside of the classroom, the faculty have been so incredibly welcoming. For all of the students, we all feel really close with them. They're all just such amazing people. It's important to have the kids know that even though they're starting up, you can have a career in music. In other schools, they may just say, oh, it's just a little fun thing to do, it's a hobby. But we give that opportunity of real world experience that you can do it. It's not just about music, it's about life. It's about living a good and full and happy life. So when our kids get out into the world, they're ready on 
on so many levels. It's a fulfilling experience in all areas, between the friendships you make, the music you make. Mila has found her people at Litchfield. I'm just happy for her. I'm happy she's found her place. I would definitely suggest the camps and other families. Folks come hang out with us and leave better, faster, stronger, like the $6 million jazz musician. It's nice. <laughs> it's nice when it's nice. It's great fun. Yeah, and we have a great time doing it. The whole, the whole journey is fun.
Thank you. Thank you again. Thank you all out there for, for dialing in. The great Matt Mitchell on piano. Equally amazing Tyshawn Sori on drums. And Mario Pavone. Collectively, we are the dialect trio. Thank you so much. <laughs>